In parts one and two of this series, we've looked at the problem of evil, deus ex machina, and infra dignitatum, three religious traditions that have mandated a strictly naturalistic origins. Now, this problem of evil is a powerful argument, and it has manifested itself several times in the history of thought. In this video, we'll look at another manifestation of the problem of evil, this time in the 17th century in the hands of the uh, Roman Catholic philosopher and theologian Nicholas Mellebranch. Now, Mellebranch is probably the only Roman Catholic we're going to look at in this series. Mostly, it's going to be Anglicans and Lutherans. But here we have a Roman Catholic pitching in. Mellebranch was concerned with the problem of evil, and his approach was to acknowledge that God could make a perfect world with no evil. There he could have achieved that objective. However, there would have been a cost. In order to make a world with no evil, it would have required God to do a lot of one-offs, a lot of particulars. God would have had to have done things differently in the United States than in Europe, than California, than in New York, differently in the South than the North, differently in every little locale, in fact. God would have had to have gone around the world doing things different species, different flora and fauna, just to get things arranged just so, so that we didn't have the diseases, the um, predation, the uh, tsunamis, the earthquakes, all the different problems that we have in the world uh, that we consider to be natural evil. Why do we have these things? God could have made a world without these things, but it would have required a lot of one-offs. Malebranche's idea was that it is a divine intention, a divine virtue, for simplicity. Now when I say simplicity, I'm not talking about simplicity in creation itself. And a lot of students um, are, get confused on this. It's not simplicity in creation, but it's simplicity in the creation acts. So God has a virtue. He uh, desires to create things with simplicity. Kind of like a good scientist, like Occam's razor. We do science using the most simple uh, explanations we can get. Well, God creates things according to Malebranche as simply as possible. Now, this gives God a trade-off or attention. So he could create the world without any natural evil, but it would have required the opposite of simplicity, a lot of complexity, a lot of one-offs and particulars. For simplicity, you're going to have to live with some things not going right. If God is going to avoid all those one-offs and use some universals, not particulars, not one-offs, but general rules or general laws, like natural laws, then things aren't always going to be just right. Let me give you a, a, a picture of this to think of, to get to get this point across. Consider a surgeon. You know, you've got a, a surgery room and you've got these bright lights and all these helpers crowded around. There's this table and there's a surgeon. Uh, working on this patient lying on the table and he's got an assistant and the assistant has uh, a, a tray or a, a, a cart with all these uh, different tools and there's all these scalpels and and different things and uh, the, 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 the surgeon says number seven and he works a little bit and he's got his binoculars there and he's looking every surgery is different every patient is different every every problem every disease has got its own little nuances and, Number 36, number 14, you know, everything is different. That's the epitome of a one-off problem, particulars. It's the opposite of what Mellebranche was getting at, that God doesn't want to do it that way. So that's Mellebranche's solution to the problem of evil. Yes, there is natural evil in the world. Yes, God could have made a perfect world without any natural evil but it would have required a long series of one-offs and particulars. Whereas God has, a, has, as a divine virtue, universals using simplicity and universals in the creation acts. So there's a tension there. There's a trade-off between the amount of natural evil that God is going to have in the world and the amount of complexity in the creation acts. And so God's going to choose some sort of a middle ground, some sort of a medium a solution there that, um, that he likes. Now, there are many ways we can criticize this idea from Mellebranch. For example, in the Bible, you look at the book of Genesis, it says, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. It doesn't seem to be a trade-off. God seems to be pleased, very pleased with his creation. He's not trading off different 
cost functions, different constraints. So we could criticize Malebranche, but I want you to resist that. I want you to resist the temptation to criticize and argue with Malebranche. Just accept the argument for now as it is. Take the argument for what it is. Malebranche is making this argument. It's his solution to the problem of evil. And I want to next move on to a video clip to show you something in this video clip. It's from Sal Khan, and, uh, who runs the Khan Academy. This is a video clip of a class that Khan is giving at the Khan Academy. This is an online tutoring service you may have heard of, very successful, popular tutoring service run out of Silicon Valley. Sal Khan's a very sharp guy, covers many subjects. This is the subject of evolution and natural selection. So let's have a listen would not point to a God who, a, a, a belief in a universal, all-powerful God, would not point to a God who designs the particular, who designs each particular, and even more, the imperfections that we see around us would, uh, you know, and, and especially because we see variation and they're being selected for it. I mean, we can't just focus on the eye. We would have to focus on viruses and cancers, and it would have to speak to a God that is designing, uh, 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 you know, one-off every version of every, uh, you know, every sequence of DNA that we see. Because what is, you know, what, if someone talks about designing an eye, we know that the eye is the byproduct of DNA. And we know that DNA is a sequence of, 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 of base pairs, you know, A, T, G, C, A, and, you know, billions and billions of them. And so when we talk about design, we would be talking literally about designing this sequence. And we even know that a lot of the sequence, there's some noise in there. We know that a lot of it comes from primitive viruses deep in our past. So the argument I'm making here is that if, uh, it, 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 in order to give credit to the all-powerful, in order to give... To, credit to the all-powerful, at least to my mind, a system that comes from very simple and elegant basic ideas. Simple and elegant basic ideas. Basic ideas like natural selection and variations uh, that, you know, in, in our DNA, there those we call those mutations. But an idea and the laws of physics and chemistry and, and those in, from that simple and elegant basic ideas for complexity to emerge, for complexity to emerge. So this is one idea, and this is what really evolution speaks to, that look, there's our universe is this profound, is this profound world, this profound uh, environment, where from these very basic, simple, beautiful ideas, we have this complexity and the structure that is truly, truly, truly awe-inspiring. This is, in my mind, what evolution speaks to. And in my mind, even as an engineer, this speaks to a, a higher form of design. This speaks to a more profound design. More profound design. So all my this this whole video the whole argument is that if if one does believe in a god and you know I I'm not going to take sides in that in this video but if it, that that and a, a god that it, that speaks to beauty and elegance and and is 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 infinitely powerful then this 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 idea of the laws of physics and chemistry and natural selection which is really i mean you know when i talked about natural selection in the last video it was really i think you would find it it was a bit of it was a bit of common sense that this is a very profound design and it speaks it speaks to the art of the designer as opposed to designing each of these entities one off okay i want to make four points about that video First, the parallel to Malebranche. Did you see it? Uh, when I teach this subject in class, I'll show this video before I talk about Malebranche, and the students really having, don't know what to make of it. Then I'll introduce Malebranche and go over Malebranche's theodicy, his solution to the problem of evil. And then I'll show that video again, and it will click. Students will see the parallel with Malebranche. You see what Khan is talking about there? God doesn't do one-offs. He doesn't do particulars. He does universals. This is the art of the design. It gives more credit to the designer. It's a better uh, art of design. It's a divine virtue. So there's a strong parallel there with Malebranche. That's point number one of my four points. Point number two, it is pervasive. This idea is pervasive. Here we are at a distance of three and a half centuries or so from Malebranche. And you have Sal Khan out of Silicon Valley, an online tutoring service on all kinds of subjects, 
essentially um, revisiting Malebranche's ideas. Now, most people, when they see that video, aren't going to even know the parallel with Malebranche. They're not going to recognize it because they're not aware of Malebranche's ideas here. They maybe have never even heard of Malebranche. Sal Khan maybe has never heard of Malebranche. Who knows? He doesn't uh, cite or acknowledge Malebranche. In fact, he presents the ideas as though they are his own. He says, it seems to me, or in my view, or something like that. So uh, it seems as though this idea is just an idea that is in the air. It's around. It is something that people like. So it is. it, it, it comes and goes. And here we have an example of an idea showing up in a very different venue, but it's the same idea. Now, my third point is that this idea is not empirical. It is not empirical science. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine you were to ask Khan, what experiment did you perform to learn this truth? How did you find out about this truth? How do you know these things about the particulars and the universals? What experiment could I perform to confirm what you're saying? What experiment could I perform to elaborate, to learn more about what you're saying? Of course, the answer is none, 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 and none. There are no experiments involved here. This is not empirical science. This is, in fact, theology. This is religious. This is metaphysical. Call it what you will. It deals with the nature, the attributes of God. That's not empirical science, last time I checked. That's religion. That's theology. In fact, it is deeply theological, or I could just say it's deep theology. And what do I mean by deep theology? It's not a sidebar. This is not a tangential idea. The, the theology part of it, the religious part of it, the metaphysical part of it, is not a sidebar. It's not, oh yeah, also this. It is critical. It's fundamental. It's a pillar of what he's the the, the argument that um, uh, that Sal Khan is setting forth here uh, entirely incorporates, entails, and hinges on the theology. If you take away the theology, take away the part about well, it, it's better for God to do it this way. Uh, it's better that the art of design is better. God wouldn't do things uh, using particulars. Take that part away, and what do you have left? There's nothing to the argument. Now, you can make other arguments all day long, but for this particular argument that we're talking about, it is deeply theological in the sense that the theology is not a sidebar, but it is entailed. It hinges on that theology. Now, my fourth point is that while this idea is deep theology, it entails and hinges on theology, it is also universally denied. That is the theological component, the fact that it hinges on theology, the fact that it is deep theology. That is denied. Uh, evolutionists will make these arguments and turn right around and say, well, no, there's no theology here. What are you talking about? Then they'll move on to the next point, and it's another theological point. The theology is perversive, so perversive that it's like water to a fish who don't realize they're swimming in water. Religious ideas are ubiquitous in evolutionary thought, in science, but especially in evolutionary thought. Humans are religious creatures. They think in these terms. We think in those terms just naturally. I know this because I've read the literature, I've been at the debates, I've done the debates, I've been in the discussions with evolutionists, and it happens again and again. And when you present them with the fact that they're making a theological, deeply metaphysical argument, they will deny that. And you'll say, what are you talking about? There's no metaphysics here. Oh, pff, I've just said that off the top of my head. That, that, that's not critical to my argument. So it's universally denied. So we're in this kind of interesting, weird situation where the religious is pervasive and ubiquitous and critical and foundational, and yet it is not acknowledged. It is, it is denied universally. This brings me to my point of application, which is, I think, this is what Darwin's greatest accomplishment was. You see, when Malebranche um, presented his ideas, he made no bones about it. These were religious theological ideas. That's what he was doing. He was doing theology. We're going to look at a lot of other traditions, a lot of other uh, deep theology, critical theological 
arguments that are crucial to evolutionary thought. And this, we'll see the same pattern. When they were presented pre-Darwin, they were presented as theological ideas. What Darwin did, and Darwin was not the first one to do this, but uh, there were, there were, it was cropping up before Darwin, but he really took it to new levels and he really um, uh, polished the art of taking deep theology and presenting it as science, presenting it as empirical findings. Darwin's book re reads that way throughout, and you can read the entire book and think that you've just read a science book even though there are theological arguments all through the text. Darwin was masterful at that, and ever since Darwin, that's what we've been dealing with, a genre that, um, where the theology is masked, and that's where we're, what we're dealing with with science today. Now, Darwin's contribution from a scientific perspective was problematic. All of the major predictions of evolutionary the theory have failed, there is no mechanism for evolutionary theory that works. Uh, random mutations and natural selection, for example, don't do the job. That's not controversial at this point. It's been debated for ever since Darwin. Uh, the patterns that we see in biology don't fit the expected evolutionary common descent patterns. Uh, the fossil record does not fit the pattern that we would expect from an evolutionary perspective. The small scale change, the adaptation that we observe in populations don't fit evolutionary change. A, uh, evolution, the, the, the kind of long um, range uh, macro change, the large scale change that you would need, that evolution needs to make sense, cannot simply be repeated rounds of the small scale adaptation that we do observe. This was once touted as a powerful evidence for evolutionary theory. We now know that's false. So the, the, the theory, the, the science has repeatedly contradicted the theory. The theory has not done well on the science. So this was not Darwin's big contribution. The theory from a scientific perspective is not his contribution. It, rather, it was this new genre, this new way of communicating theological ideas as just science. We saw that in the video cut with Sal Khan presenting these deeply theological ideas as, well, just logical ideas, just common sense. It's just a given these days. It's science, after all. So what we're seeing is how deep theology can influence science, can drive the science. But we've only just begun. We've only scratched the surface. We have another dozen or so parts to go, and we're going to see much, much more significant, influential theological ideas driving science. Religion drives science, and it matters.